Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I want to say thank you to Bill and Archaeology Southwest for inviting me to come and do this talk uh, and come and become a part of the organization. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more of my introduction a little bit, but I want to give uh, due credit where it's due. Um, my association with Archaeology Southwest and Desert Archaeology spans back about 10 years ago when uh, I was still employed uh, as the archaeology program manager for the Hopi tribe. I left that job to pursue other endeavors, mainly because I wasn't ready to sit in an office for 40 hours a week <clears throat> and be a program manager. I had other endeavors that I wanted to pursue. And so I took this leap of faith and left a secure job and went out on my own as an independent consultant. As a part of that, as part of my work through the tribe, I had met Sarah Hare and some of her staff that were working on other archaeology projects during that time. And one of the projects they were working on uh, was a project out on wide ruins. Uh, and so I took a group of Hopi elders out there and we did a little bit of consultation work with her. When I decided to make that leap of faith and go out on my own, she reached out to me and offered me a job on the Highway 260 project that was working uh, east of Camp Verde. And so it was at that start that I became acquainted with Desert Archaeology, Archaeology Southwest, who they were as an organization, both of them, and then starting my relationship, uh, which has borne a lot of different fruit along the way for both of us. And so because of that interaction and that introduction, uh, I'm here today, and I'm really grateful that they have continually continued to reach out to Native communities, not only in seeking our knowledge, but also in seeking ways to help employ our people out home. As we know, employment is very hard to come by. So these opportunities give folks out home a different type of exposure. Not only do they get a paycheck, but they get exposed to something for all intents and purposes, is very foreign to us as Native communities. And so I want to give them uh, the credit and thank them very much for allowing me to be a part of their history to this point in time. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to the staff of Archaeology Southwest and Desert Archaeology. When they asked me to do this talk, normally I'm like, OK, sure, whatever. And then you, <laughs> you file it away, and you never think about it again until a week or so before the event happens, right? <clears throat> so I was at home uh, minding my own business, right? <laughs> and I get an email from Linda saying, hey, by the way, remember this thing you committed to. And I was like, oh, that's right, I did. And luckily she did because I was committed to go do something else this weekend. But um, she reached out and reminded me and said, hey, remember you committed to be a board member? And you also committed to come and give a talk. So I, I scratched out my calendar and penciled in Archaeology Southwest for the weekend. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. Um, again, when she asked me months ago what my talk would be about, man, there's all kinds of things we can talk about when it comes to Hopi. And so I just threw out a general topic in terms of what originally you see on, on the placard or the little advert that you got, you know, Hopi clan migrations and archaeology. I thought about that a little bit, and I was like, well, I can, I can finesse that, because uh, there is a lot that we can talk about. But I wanted to keep it focused to something that is really relevant to myself, to the communities out home, and to the work that we're working on, both from the scientific perspective, but also from within our own indigenous community. So you know, as a writer, I do a lot of writing. They tell you, write what you know, right? And so I had to think long and hard about what do I know about? What is my history as it comes to not only being a Hopi person, but also how does it relate to my involvement in the field of archaeology? I work as an archaeologist. I work as a river guide. I work as a backcountry hiking guide. I do a lot of public education and outreach. Inevitably, that question comes up. Why did you choose? archaeology? How is it that you became who you are today? And there's a lot of process behind that. There's a lot of history that has to go into answering that question. 
How I came to be who I am standing before you today is a reflection of many, many generations that came before me. It's a reflection of my own individual family history and how that has influenced how I came to choose archaeology. So I changed my topic. You know, I, I decided to talk more, not to be narcissistic in a way, but I want to talk about my experiences here in archaeology. And what is it that influenced me from the time I was born to the time I am now? What is it that continues to encourage me to be a part of this field, given its somewhat negative history within indigenous communities across the United States? And so I thought about it, you know, this is the title I came up with. When we talk about clan migrations, we can talk in different capacities about it. This is about my migration through my career, my experiences in working with many of you out there, many archeologists, anthropologists, museum specialists out there, folks from the outside world who come to Hopi and want to know about Hopi culture and how is that two-way street that we engage in, that dialogue, how is that established and how do we carry on? So this is gonna be a reflection about my experiences I don't claim to speak for all Hopi people out there. This is individualized. But again, I'm drawing from multiple influences that comes from my community. So we'll begin with what this presentation won't be about, right? I kind of gave you a little bit of work. I've been to several talks like this from outsiders who talk about clan migrations, and they tend to get caught up in this huge epic story of groups of people moving across the landscape, focusing on a lot of traditional cultural knowledge that may or may not be appropriate to be shared with other folks out there. I'm not going to talk about that in specifics. I'm not going to focus or talk about other clans that I do not belong to. And I'm not going to talk on esoteric knowledge associated with some of these migrations. So uh, it'll be the shortest talk you ever had, talks over, <laughs> right? But, that's just to give you a sense of, again, where I'm coming from, that I don't claim to be an expert on this. This is my experience in working within my own communities and listening to those folks that I'm fortunate to have share their information with me. And so this is a reflection back on them. It's as much a homage to them as it is talking about my accomplishments here in archaeology. This is who I am, okay? And this is important to remember. These are my clans. My mother's clan is Tepbunga, Greasewood, from Third Mesa. My father is Snake Clan from Third Mesa. We come from the village of Bakavi on Third Mesa. How many folks have been to Hopi and have visited the Hopi Mesas, have worked out there? That just gives me a sense. I always have to ask that question so that I can get a sense of where do I need to take this talk and how much more do I need to explain to you all about what I'm trying to illustrate here. Keep in mind those two clans because that is what I'm going to talk about. In Hopi, you're not culturally allowed to talk about other clan histories that you don't come from. That's their knowledge. That's their set of history to know. Given that I come, we identify as matrilineal, I can talk about the Greasewood clan migrations as they've been related to me. And to a smaller extent, I can talk about my father's side Interestingly for me, I didn't grow up knowing my mother's side until I was much older in life, until I was in high school. My father's side is the one who raised me from the time I was born up until about high school. So I always thought I was snake clan. But I come to find out that no, that's not the truth. You, are, you belong to another group of people. But through that history and through that interaction, I was able to learn both sides. And so I'm drawing from those two sets of knowledge, and that's what sets my cultural boundaries for me. There are boundaries in place, both personally and culturally, that I have to adhere to. I can't cross those, which means that I can't tell you too much, and I have to be wary of what I'm talking about. Fortunately, I've been doing this long enough that I kind of know where those boundaries are, and in my internal mind, I can sense myself wandering off into dangerous territory, so to speak, so I can kind of bring myself back. But this is what this talk is going to center about, who I am as a Hopi person based on my clan history, 
my education, my experience both within uh, university settings and in my professional career, <clears throat> but also based on my own individual family raising and how all that influenced me to say, okay, I want to become an archaeologist. So let's go ahead and, and get started here. Uh, Mr. T.J. Ferguson is in the back there, and I, and I respect him a great deal for the work that he's done amongst the Hopi community. He's enabled us in many ways to be able to collect and record our knowledge so that it can not only be shared with groups like you all, but that we can take it back out home and share it and teach our own folks there. This quote comes from some of his research there, and I, when I read that quote, Instantly, I knew that it applied to my life because if you think about what migrations are talking about, groups of people moving from one place to the next, learning, gathering experience, getting to one spot and sharing that knowledge with whoever they encounter. That's what we all do in some instance throughout our lives here. But for me, in reflection back, I, I recently turned 42 about four or five days ago. <clears throat> and in that time, I've been working as a professional archaeologist for about 20 years. So I have about 20 years of professional experience to draw from, but I have about 40 plus years of personal experience to draw from. And all of that is combining now so that in my migration from one place to the next, I'm able to apply those experiences and learn from each and every one of them and then carry it to the next, wherever I end up at. So. Keep this in mind, okay, as we go, because I try to make it, you know, um, they always say, Hopi, we're not linear, right? We don't start at point A and end up at point B. Our time frames are not just, you know, the past to the present. They're cyclical, and then they kind of have this squiggly line that goes all over. And so in that sense, that's how I'm approaching uh, this presentation in terms of reflecting back on my life and my experiences. We're going to jump around and talk about some of the places I've worked at. What did I learn as an archeologist? And what did I learn as a Hopi person once I got engaged in this field? And what, was I, what, am, what am I then able to carry from those two sets of experiences and knowledge and apply somewhere else? So there's my mother, my older brother, my older sister, and me. Where am I? Well, I wouldn't start showing up in these pictures until about nine months later, <clears throat> okay? This is how I grew up. I have the fortune, fortunate experience to come from a family who, instead of taking us to Disneyland and SeaWorld, we went to places like Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon and Wapatki. We spent our summers traveling around the Southwest. I didn't know what I was missing out on, and I still don't because I have never been to those places yet, but um, my father would tell me, you know, I was probably, as I grew older, eight, nine, ten years old, he would always say this line to me about, you are related to the people who once lived here. At that young age, I had no idea what he was talking about. What did he mean? There's nobody living here. How could I be related to these people? It took me a long time, right? It took me about 10 more years. You fast forward till I'm about in high school when I become a more participant in Hopi religious ceremonies and I start to learn more about who I am as a Hopi individual. Through our ceremonies, they teach you this history about who you are and where you come from. In our songs, in our prayers, they're reiterating all of this epic migration history but it's given to you in little bits and pieces here and there. And so it wasn't until much later on in life that I started to understand what he meant by these words when he would say these to me when we were at Mesa Verde or Chaco Canyon. I think I'm probably, hopefully not, maybe this will change, but I'm probably one of the last generations of Hopi kids out there who were kicked out the door during summertime and told to get lost. <clears throat> Go explore, right? Take your gun, take some water, take some food, whatever, and get out the door and don't come back till whenever. And so we did. 
we got lost. We took off. And my cousins and I would spend hours out there on the landscape, hiking miles to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. We'd come back at the end of the day and sit around the dinner table with our parents and our grandparents. And they would ask you, where did you go today? What did you guys see? And we tell them these stories of, okay, we went to the south where there's a spring. Oh, this, this, that's this spring. And they tell us a history about it. Or we went to the north and there's ruins and rock art up there. Oh, that's this clan's home. And they would tell us more about it. So through a series of years, you develop an idea of a, of a cultural landscape mentally in your head. You don't even have to go and visit those places. You can close your eye and you can imagine that space out on the landscape and the associated history that goes along with it. And so for us, that's how we grew up, you know, kind of learning this history throughout the years and experiencing it firsthand. That is the key part to a lot of what Hopi history and culture is about. It's about learning these things firsthand and then experiencing it. And that's something that we're all missing nowadays in, in, in this modern day. And it's something that I try and encourage not only folks of my generation, but my kids' generation and every other generation out there that in order for you to really understand this, this history, you have to see it and experience it firsthand. I encourage them to go out there. Don't be afraid to leave the reservation. Don't be afraid to go out and, and learn something new. And so hopefully, you know, that bears fruit somewhere down the line. So I was in high school and I graduated and I moved into the university setting and I struggled for a couple years. My GPA just kept going down and down and down and I kept trying different majors like flipping cards out and none of them worked. None of them stuck with me. Just through chance, I happened to meet a professor from Northern Arizona University who was doing work out at my village at Bakavi. I knew him through his son. We played football in high school, but I didn't know him really what he did until that summer of about 1996, 97, somewhere around there. And he introduced me to the field of archaeology, anthropology. He asked me, have you ever considered pursuing this field? And I said, no way. I said, my parents, my grandparents have told me what you people have done out here at Hopi. The intrusiveness, the disrespectful uh, work that has gone on in the previous two centuries. They carried those memories. It's a vivid memory for many families out at Hopi about researchers coming out and, and how they were intrusive in their research methods and how they did their work, how they disrespected Hopi ceremonies. And that left a burning memory for them that carried on to their children. So eventually he convinced me and my mother convinced me to stay in school and I continued on. I remember the day that I went home to Hopi and we're sitting around the big dinner table having dinner. And one of my aunts asked me, are you still in school? I'm still there. What have you chosen to study? Archaeology. <laughs> and there was dead silence. I could feel the burning from everybody around the table looking at me. Are you crazy? Haven't you learned anything from what we have taught you? We had to take a step back. In Hopi, nobody really ever prevents anybody from doing what your true intentions are. They allowed me to pursue that route. Over the years, it's come kind of full circle and we'll, we'll kind of get back to that about how perceptions and perspectives in my family have changed about archeology span and anthropology. My dad was one of my harshest critics at the time. He wanted me to pursue something else. He was disappointed in my decision to continue on pursuing this field because it was foreign to him. He had no idea about what it really meant. So I made that step and I took off with it. I was fortunate again to have professors at the university setting who were very supportive, who helped us in our daily work about managing how to get through the mindset of how to be an archeologist. 
Where I landed at is here, Wapatki. I remember coming here as a kid and touring and hearing about Snake Clan history as it relates to this general area. But about 1997 through about 2002, this was my home base. I was employed by the National Park Service as a student worker, both during my undergrad and my graduate. So I was fortunate to have a job that allowed me to experience archaeology on a daily basis and work with archaeologists who were truthful in their ignorance of Hopi culture, but also very respectful in their actions towards you. They had purpose in what they wanted you to learn. During those formative years, man, I did my best. I wanted to be an archaeologist. That's what I wanted to become. I wanted to know how to identify the sherds on the ground. I wanted to know how to draw maps of a structure. I wanted to know how to do the technical data collection. I wanted to learn how to generate reports later on. So I spent a good eight years here working, learning, refining that craft, really wanting to achieve the goal of being able to call myself an archaeologist, right? That was my goal. I didn't want to be known as a Hopi archaeologist yet. I wasn't comfortable with that addition to it. I was simply an archaeologist, and I was comfortable in that setting. So I spent a great deal of time here. This is, this is my home that I still, to this day, when I go out to Wapatki, I know that place like the back of my hand, right? I've been everywhere. I've seen everything in there. From sun up to sun down, I've been out in the field. From the burning hot sands of summer to the blizzards of winter, I've experienced that place. So to me, that is home in many more ways than one than just being where I learned how to become an archaeologist. But during this time, the late 90s, I also started to hear and becoming more, again, attuned to my mother's side of the family. Who were those people that I was supposed to identify with? Lo and behold, I lucked out again because my uncle happened to be the director of the Hopi Culture Preservation Office. And he heard that I was interested in archaeology. He found that a little bit weird, I guess, because at the time, there, there are no Hopi archaeologists, right? True Hopi archaeologists. I guarantee you, even today, if I were to go out home and count on my hands the number of professional Hopis who have degrees or multi-year experience in archaeology, anthropology, museum studies, there's more of you in this room than there are out home who have that experience and degree. I tell people we may be outnumbered, but we're not outgunned <laughs> because we come armed with this cultural history, this understanding of who we are. That's, who we, that's what we bring to the table, right? So it was during that time that I got to know more about who my uncle was and the work he was doing at that time. It was then that I also got to exposed to a group of elders that he was working with during doing different consultation work around the Southwest. One of them was my uncle uh, on my dad's side, Farrell Sikyakuku, who's a, he's passed away now, but he's a member of the Snake Clan from Sipalavi. But his mother's originally from Bakavi, where I'm from. His mom and my grandmother are more or less sisters, and so there's a close relationship between our families there. And it was he who kind of took me under his wing as well. I remember as a little kid, he would tell us stories when he would come and visit my grandmother. And, and one of the stories he told that we're not going to really get into today was the story of the boy who journeys down the Colorado River and comes back and ultimately brings back knowledge which lends to the creation of the Snake Clan. We'll talk a little bit about that, but not much. It's a, it's a very, when he told it during the winter time, it took four days for him to reiterate this story to us. And he did it so that we could really know who we, are, who we are as people and have that cultural knowledge carrying through. But it was during this time that he told me about the Snake Clan history as it relates to Wapatki. You know, he was a very knowledgeable person in, in the history of the clan. And he talked about clan migrations coming from Navajo Mountain, from north of Wapatki area. 
and how those groups of Snake Clan people made their way south. Ultimately, some of them ended up at Wapatki. And he believes that Wapatki was the first place that they ever performed a snake dance there in the amphitheater down below. That was just based on his own cultural understanding and histories that had been told to him over many, many years. Uh, this is just an interesting side note. The, the mural here, I don't know if any of you know Donna Reiner. Um, I don't know where she is nowadays, uh, but she's a museum kind of person. And this is a mural that was painted by a white guy that used to be in a bank, I think, in Phoenix. He painted a series of these. And the bank was scheduled to be torn down. And she thought that it would be a travesty for murals like this to be torn down with it. And so she actually salvaged this mural and a couple others. And this is a fairly large mural. I think it's about 20 by 15. So it's pretty much life size. Uh, we had hopes that we could bring it out to Hopi and put it on display. Uh, but just through the overwhelming amount of work that Hopi has to deal with, that never really happened. These are still rolled up and archived, as far as I know, somewhere in the valley. She has personal possession of these. And so maybe somewhere down the line we can um, bring those home. But uh, it's just another interesting tangent about the different works that we get involved in and how consultation helps facilitate the almost bringing home of a lot of different things, right? So, so I stayed at Wapatki for that number of years. And then I picked up and we moved on. I went on another migration and ended up here. Inscription House, which is up in Navajo National Monument, right, which is in northeastern Arizona there, which consists of three different Park Service units, Coestima, uh, Kitsil, Dalastima, Batarakin, and Tsuovi, Inscription House. Tsuovi means, you know, snake house up high, kind of, it's that connotation. And I was told by my uncles that this is an ancestral snake clan home and that they have stories. It's located about maybe 10, 15 miles south of Navajo Mountain there. So there's a really close association with that whole history there. Um, when Farrell was still alive, he took a bunch of us up to Navajo Mountain and uh, showed us where the shrines were, where the ancient villages were there that, that they once inhabited. And he told us about that landscape out there, right? And he recalls a village out there, he would just point off, off into the canyon land distance about a home out there that Tzu'etnyum once occupied. And he never really went into great detail. So I spent several field seasons out there, right, still refining my craft of becoming an archaeologist, learning how to map sites in great detail. That was my really great passion that I still carry to this day. Uh, when we started off in the late 90s with a group of us, there was a workshop that helped facilitate our transition into archaeology that was sponsored by the Hopi Culture Preservation Office, uh, Northern Arizona University, and the Hopi Foundation. And they employed about eight of us Hopis uh, to go and learn and study with archaeologists from the Flagstaff Area National Monuments. And so we spent three months really getting that, you know, kind of just thrown right into the lake about archaeology and learning what that means. One of the first things that we all immediately took to was the creation of maps. This idea of being artistic yet technical, detailed yet creative, right, appealed to us in many, many ways. And they saw that. They saw that we had an aptitude for this kind of skill. And they encouraged it. They nurtured it. They said, man, you guys really get into this map stuff, so we're going to spend extra time learning how to do that. And so to this day, it's still one of those things that um, I guess I don't want to say I'm old school because I'm really not, but breaking out the piece of paper, the graph paper, your compass, your line tape, and doing it by hand versus now sometimes I have to walk around with a trimble and just take points that are pretty boring, you know, there's no feeling to it, versus something where I was really learning how to do the technical part of, of archaeology. I was still struggling to convince my family that this mattered, that archaeology mattered. They still, in some ways, were having a little bit a hard time making the connection between 
traditional knowledge and how does that apply within an archaeological setting? Why is that meaningful? I was cautioned to talk about and share with other non-natives about what I knew about these places. And so there's this continual dialogue, right? This is maybe six, seven years after I started, you know, my initial archaeological shooting. So we're still going through that process of how to engage each other and how do we make it meaningful to one another beyond just one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I spent a great deal of time here learning several field seasons, right? The classic archaeological experience of being out in the field for multiple seasons, enduring all kinds of weather personalities uh, and work environments, you know, and you take that experience. And I came out of this thinking, man, I'm an archaeologist now, right? I feel like I finally had earned that right to, to call myself. You could give me a shirt. I know what that is. You could tell me to go map that site. I'll go do it, right? Fill out the data forms. Okay, Lyle, we're going to do the report. I can, I can take care of that. But then I had graduated. I, I, the interesting side note to this whole thing is you talk about all this snake clan history here. Well, I graduated in May 2002 with my master's. The next day I went to work. They put me on a truck and shipped me to Lee's Ferry, put me on a raft, and sent me down the Colorado River for 21 days where I did work in the Grand Canyon. But I also remembered my snake clan history as it related to that. So I was able to experience again Get that one-on-one -on -one experience of who are you as a person. It's not just something I read in a book. It's not just something that I'm collecting data. I can do all those things, but in the back of my mind, I know that I have a cultural connection to that area. And so the experience becomes richer and it becomes more fuller and I'm able to come back, you know. That was kind of the shifting point right there that river trip, coming back from that experience and relaying to my family what we did, what we learned, and how we applied it. Then you can start to see some of the wheels turn, particularly in my father. He started to understand what I was doing with my life and my, and my career moving forward. So um, it was a really you know, fundamental time for me in, in developing that, that whole bridging the two sides of things, which is where I'm still at today, but it was really where I was learning how to do it. One of the things my uncle talked about when he talked about Tzu Ovi was a map. He said, there's a map there. And I didn't know what he meant. He goes, it's a map on a wall. And he goes, it talks about how the clans came together in that area. And it was something that he had never seen in real life. His elders had seen it, they had visited this place, and they had told him verbally and orally about what was there. And so, it may be hard to see the me. There's a snakehead here, right? You see the snakehead, and it goes this way. This is probably 20, 25 feet long. It's a fairly long petroglyph. Above it is this weird kind of spider looking thing. That was the metaphor for the past that these clans took to come together to that area. And so what that did for me and others on that, there, there were other Hopis working with me at the Park Service during this time. There were two or three others there at the same time with me. That brings to light, right, your history. That turns on these synapses in your brain that make it real. It's not just something that somebody told to you anymore. It really does exist out there. It's not a fable, it's not a myth, it's not a legend, it's truth. And so what that does to you as a native person, as an individual, is it gives you confidence. It gives you faith that what you are being taught has substance to it. It's not something that's just made up that you can actually put faith in the words about what you are hearing and learning and know that these things exist out there for you to carry forward. It's like getting a spiritual shot in the arm, right, about who you are as a person and being able to say, we are still there. We were there then and we're still here now. So I walked away from that experience again, 
proud. Still wasn't calling myself a Hopi archaeologist. I was just an archaeologist, but I was damn proud to be able to call myself that. So I, I left the park, or the park Service, yeah, and I moved on, and I ended up out at Hopi. I accepted the job as the archaeology program manager. And I wasn't there for more than 10 days when my boss, my Uncle Lee, said, hey, we need you to take on this project. I said, sure. What is it, survey? What is it, documentation? What is it? Give it to me. I can do it. He said, no. He said, it's reburial. I didn't know what he meant. Reburial of what? A structure? That's what we do at the Park Service. We go back and backfill things, and I'm comfortable doing that. He said, no. Reburial of us, of our ancestors. <clears throat> that was probably the biggest shock for me in my career up until that point. I had no idea the logistics and the experience, both from the scientific side, but also culturally, that I was about to embark on this journey that I was supposed to undertake with my ancestors. I had to coordinate the reburial of over 2,000 individuals at Mesa Verde National Park. It was a daunting task of day in and day out of how do you do this? How do we approach this? Not just from the logistical side of how big does this pit have to be? How fast do we have to work? How many people have to be involved? There was the cultural side of things. Hopi does not have a reburial practice. Once they were in the ground, they were intended to stay there. But through acts of nature, and more so acts of archaeologists, they didn't stay there. They ended up in boxes, labeled, put on a shelf, gathering dust, not doing anybody any good. So I had the task of coordinating this event, right? and trying to come to terms. I don't want to be an archaeologist anymore. <clears throat> if this is what they're going to do, I don't want to do this. But it was my responsibility. It was my responsibility not only as an archaeologist, but as a Hopi person. I've always told people that if we are going to become involved in this field, we have a responsibility to right the wrongs of the past, no matter how difficult it can be. We chose this path. We can't just take the good from it. I can't just take the title of archaeologist. I have to become and accept that I am first and foremost always going to be a Hopi. And so then I became a Hopi archaeologist. Because then I took on the responsibility of not just doing the archaeological work, I took on the responsibility of caring for those people who could not do it for themselves anymore, our ancestors. And so we did it. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. In one day, 2,000 folks went back into the ground. Later on at Chaco, we did over 300. But it's a very surreal experience to be standing before a large pit looking at the remains of your ancestors. They're neither good nor bad at this point. They're just surreal to me. Did, I, did that really happen? You know, And you go through the process of putting them back in. And you talk to them. It's a very individualized experience for me. I don't want to be bothered. Just bring me the stuff. And really, because of my youth at the time and to this day, I have to be the one in the, in the pit, unboxing things, laying them out, making sure that things are going right. There are other folks involved, like my uncle and a few others, but as they've grown older, they're no longer physically able to do these tasks anymore. And so more and more it falls to myself, and there really isn't anybody else out there willing to do this. When, when, when we were coordinating, which wasn't the first reburial, but when we were coordinating this Mesa Verde event, and we asked for volunteers from the community, from our staff. Nobody wanted to do it. It was very hesitant. What are we getting ourselves into? My family 
cautioned me heavily. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I had to explain to them, it's my responsibility to do this. I may not have brought them out of the ground, but I'm a part of the process that allowed that to happen. And so now I have to be a part of the solution and, and allow those folks, whoever they are, I may have never known them in real life, our paths only cross on that day. But I owe them that respect. And so that was the time when I learned how to become a Hopi archaeologist. That's when I started to identify myself as such. Because it was then that I really truly understood that there was more to it than just being the scientist. I couldn't just do the science work. I had to pay respect and lean on my cultural side. That's always going to be there for me. And I have to accept it and learn how to integrate these two different perspectives. And so I went forward. We got through it. We got through those. And since then, there have been numerous other reburial events that my uncle and I have been involved in. Nothing as ever as large as what we went through at Mesa Verde, but still, you know, some highly controversial things going on with this, uh, both in the scientific community, scientists, archaeologists saying, man, we really wish you wouldn't bury that guy because he's really cool to us, you know? And there are times when I have to, I have to caution my fellow archeologists while we're in the process. They want to do infield analysis at that moment. Look at this pot, look at this. And they want to challenge themselves to be an archeologist, but that's, that's, that's not the time to do it. That time has come and gone. We're here to achieve a different purpose and so you know, it's about that education thing. So we got through it. One of the things that I gained out of this experience was, again, learning more of my clan history. Now I started to learn more about my Tepungo side, my Griswit side, who we were as a people, where did we travel through. I came to find out that our clan has ties to the Mesa Verde area on the southern end where the Ute Tribal Park is at. There's Greasewood clan history in that area. I learned that our clan has ties to Aztec and Chaco through ceremony that has been developed over years and years and years that Greasewood and our brother or sister clans have had ceremonies that are still carried out today, but they had their origins back then. And so again, it's more, it's about bringing to light this experience, these histories. It is real, it is tangible. And now I'm able to say I can bring the scientific and the cultural to the, same, to the same playing field and look at it from that perspective. This is an endeavor that, uh, again, recently I've been more involved in uh, through Archaeology Southwest, Friends of Cedar Mesa, the Bears Ears National Monument, right? I've been a river guide up on the San Juan River for over 10 years now. So I'm pretty familiar with that southern area of it, not so much the northern part of that, north of the river, north of Cedar Mesa, kind of still brand new to me. So for me, this is again, another one of those endeavors where I have the opportunity to be a Hopi archeologist, to learn about the science going on in there. My colleagues that are working up in that area are doing really interesting, great work, but where does the Hopi side come in now? And so that's kind of where we're at right now. We're trying to, at least from my perspective, I'm still trying to massage the cultural knowledge about that area and how does it apply to this endeavor here. So, you know, we're gonna continue on working on this. Uh, hopefully TJ and his folks can continue to help support the tribe in developing the understanding of this area so that we have a good idea of how Hopi fits in here. There are some analogies going on right now. There's some rock art that Sally Cole has shared with the tribe about, you know, maybe directly connected to Hopi. There are small caches of Hopi yellowware that have been found in the general vicinity which directly link back to Hopi. So there's some evidence there. We just need to continually to do some more work on it. And so hopefully, you know, within the next year or so as we move down the line, um, we, we start to learn more and more about that. So support it. Whether or not you support the monument status, support the work that's going on. That's the key part of it. Because not only are you helping to enrich your understanding, but you're helping to enrich our cultural understanding as Hopi people. Why is that important, right? 
This is another line from my uncle. The meaning of the past is what it contributes to life in the present. Is that history just relegated to prehistory? I kid my archaeology friends about that term because it's static. It has no meaning to it. It has no meaning whatsoever to Hopi. It means that you're just there in the past and you should stay there in the past. We have moved forward over the generations to be here in 2017 just like anybody else, but despite overwhelming odds. And we still carry this knowledge and this understanding and these values forward with us. So what do we do with that? Is it just so that I can come and give a cool talk to whoever? No. Again, it's so that I can be a Hopi archaeologist and go back home and teach my own people what's going on out there. Again, this goes back to that statement. You have to experience these places firsthand to really grasp what we're talking about. I can write all I want. I can put it in a book. I can show you videos. But you have to go experience that place. It's like if any of you have heard your whole lifetime about your homeland, and all of a sudden one day you get to go home and experience it, that whole mental idea of who you are, where do you come from? More importantly, where are you going? That all comes to life, right? One of my uncles, Vernon Messias, also says, you'll never know where you're going unless you understand where you've been. So you have to continually look back but as you're moving forward. This is what we're hoping to achieve through different endeavors out home right now. Taking Hopa youth out, taking Native youth out, Indigenous youth out, and giving them the opportunities to experience their ancestral lands so that they have that understanding. So it's not just me talking to them. I get to talk to them, but I also get to take them out there. I can put them on a boat, we can go down river, put a backpack on them, we can go on a hike, and they can experience this. It happens at an inter-tribal level, but it also happens within Hopi, where Hopi also has these processes in place where we can teach amongst ourselves so that we're learning back and forth. I'm going to go ahead and try and wrap up here real quick. We're going to come back now. My migration has taken us a little ways around the southwest, and now we're going to come back to Apatki, my home. There was a day where I was working in one of the rooms, doing ruins preservation, right, putting mud in the cracks and just minding my own business, when I had a hard hat on. I felt the rock bounce off and thought it was one of my coworkers. Another rock bounced off. It's hot, I'm irritated, I want to get done for the day. So I turn around and I look, and it's my paternal grandmother and my uncle standing there. They had a habit of showing up because <laughs> that was their home, their snake clan, so that was their home as well. All my irritability, frustrations disappear, and I put my tools down, and I know that I'm done for the day. And they're going around, and my grandma's 106 right now, so far as we know. Back then, <laughs> she was maybe 90-something. Her son, who's probably 80-something now, still drives her around to the field, and they go out and do things together. Back then, one of their favorite things to do is when they would come to Flagstaff to town, is take the long way home, and let's go to Wapatki. Let's go visit Lyle. And so I would walk around with them. And on that hot July day, we were walking along, and I'm reading the tour guide out. And they know it by heart. They've been there a number of times. But they still want to read it. They still want to know. My grandmother would point at the artifacts that are left out in the room and say, see, we knew how to do it then, and we still know how to do it. We didn't just make this up. This is who we are. This is who you are. Along the way, we kind of got split up. And my uncle wandered off, and I ended up talking to a coworker, and my grandmother wandered off, and so I had to catch up at the end of the day. So I'm walking up the trail, and it's a blind corner. There's a big room block, and I can just hear my grandmother talking on the other side. She's talking in Hopi to somebody. I thought she was talking to my uncle. I come around the corner, and she's standing there by herself, facing a room. 
And I asked her, who are you talking to? And she kind of smiles and looks down and then looks up at me and she goes, nobody really, but I know that they are still here listening and watching. Thank you. So I don't really know how this goes in terms of Q&A. Uh, there's some additional information here. My email, my blog address, and I recently got into podcasting. So if you are down for radio programs and things of that nature, uh, without a lot of flash, but it'll get to the point and it'll teach you a lot about different folks around the Southwest, indigenous tribes, uh, log in. We try and put out a program once a month. And we recently put out a program about museum works. It was a group discussion. Next month, I'll be up on stage again, uh, at least in the radio format. We'll be putting out uh, a program about Hopi museum work that's ongoing currently out at the tribe. And so if you're interested in why Hopi doesn't have a true museum yet, tune in. And you'll figure it out and you'll hear about the process that the tribe and nonprofit folks have been going through so that you know, we, someday down the line, we can be proud to say we have a true Hopi Museum come on out and visit us. So again, thank you for showing up. I feel very privileged to have been a part of this uh, and hopefully down the line, I'll be able to come back again. So thank you very much. The, the, the gentleman asked about the history of uh, the individuals in the reburial process and how they came to be. A majority of them resulted out of past archaeological excavations um, within the park. And it was a big coordination through I think the Colorado Historical Society, the SHPO there, about, it, it, this took multi-years, right? By the time I got there, most of the research had been done in terms of where these individuals were, how they got to be in the different repositories. And so a lot of that groundwork had been achieved already. And so we had a good inventory list about which different institutions had remains um, related to Mesa Verde National Park within the park boundaries. And so it was out of that inventory list that we were drawing from. And so there was a dozen or more people involved in terms of who they worked for, what institution, uh, how did they coordinate that movement of uh, remains to the burial site. So it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of groundwork was put in um, so that we had a good understanding of how many individuals were out there. And then the daunting task for the outside folks, the physical anthropologists was identifying individual remains. Were they male? Were they female? What age range? Were they infants? Because there's, we had to establish some sort of protocol in the reburial process about who goes in first, what order, what placement. Uh, and it all has to do with cultural uh, beliefs in terms of how, it, how that plays out. Again, hope we never asked for this to happen. None of the tribes that have ever had to deal with reburial have ever asked to given this task but it's something that we assume because these are our ancestors. Each, other, each tribe that chooses to undertake this endeavor has to figure out in some way their own cultural process. How are we going to do this? And so I know at Hopi, even before I showed up, there was many, many discussions held about what is appropriate. How are we going to do this? How are we going to respectfully put these people back into the ground? And what are the cultural process, the material things, the, the prayers, all that stuff, how does that get played out? And so some people were definitely against it. Some understood that it was a responsibility. Um, but for the most part, those individuals came from a number of different institutions and organizations within Colorado, some out of state, of course, and federal agencies. Uh, and that all had to be coordinated with the Park Service. There were other tribes involved, but Hopi ultimately assumed the lead role in it. And so Southern Ute, Zuni, uh, and a couple of the other New Mexico Pueblos came and lent a hand the day it happened. But for the most part, Hopi assumed the lead in, 
in not only the technical logistics of it, but also the cultural and spiritual logistics behind it as well. So, and that varies from reburial to reburial. Sometimes Hopi has a hands off and they say, well, let Zuni, somebody else take the, the lead in it and we'll let them handle it. Um, it just depends on geography and kind of, you know, a lot of maybe sometimes politics involved as well. So it's a complicated process that takes many, many years for it to finally happen. And we hope to, when the process actually happens, we try and make it happen in one day. It follows Hopi practice that when a person passes on, we try and, and get them onto the next, onto their journey as quick as possible. And so many, many times I encourage my staff or whoever I'm working with, don't eat, don't drink, take short breaks. Let's talk to one another, but let's keep to the task at hand so that way we can meet that end goal of being done before the sun goes down and we can all move on in, in, in our next daily process. So um, a lot of stuff goes on in, in that process, so. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. So yeah, like I mentioned, my dad, right? Uh, very disappointed in me that day. Very disappointed in me for a long time. My, my father's a pretty simple man, right? He's a rancher, he's a farmer. He's pretty hard, he's got a narrow set of rules, right? That's how I grew up. So for him, he had aspirations that I would follow in his footsteps and go into construction, which I was doing at the time and enjoying it very well. That has a connection to why I got into archeology, span but we won't go there. So nowadays, you know, um, I can't keep my dad out of archeology span sites. <laughs> <clears throat> nowadays, he serves on a, an advisory task team called the Cultural Resource Advisory Task Team out at Hopi where he and other members of the community, elders, come together and share cultural information with outside organizations, outside researchers who come to Hopi with questions about who we are as a people. So now, my father reads every book I've ever had on the bookshelf. Uh, whenever I get a new Archaeology Southwest magazine, my dad steals it, and, and I don't see it for a while. So he has come full circle now. And so now for him and I, uh, that's become our shared goal in understanding about who we are as Hopi people through archaeology, but also through who we are as Hopi people. So nowadays, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's not as physical as he used to be in terms of being able to get out, but as often as he can, as much as TJ's willing to pay him to go on <laughs> site visits, he'll go out and, and do the work, but he'll do it regardless. And so... Uh, yeah, he's, he's totally done a 180, and um, I'm proud to say that out of all the things my dad has taught me in life, I was able to reverse that and give him something back that has meaning to him now. So nowadays, he recognizes rock art, he recognizes the shirts, he understands the cultural history, and he's become more vocal about it. He always used to tell me, we didn't grow up learning that stuff. He was lying to me. He just didn't want to tell me. <laughs> <clears throat> come to find out he knows a great deal of things and that's just something that he's held within himself as an individual all these years and it took his son and others to coax it out of him so uh, that circle you know has, has completed itself so Very good. yeah